and welcome to Superintendent's Roundtable. I'm Deborah Vinsel from Thurston Community Media. This is our last roundtable for the 2016-17 school year, and we're pleased to have with us in the studio again the superintendents from the four largest school districts in Thurston County. So let me introduce them. We've got John Bash from the Tumwater Schools, Brian Wharton from the Yelm Community Schools, Dick Sivitanich from the Olympia School District, and Deborah Clemens from the North Thurston Public Schools. So I know that this time of year is really busy and that you're always busy when you come to see us here at the round table, but we do appreciate you taking time um, out of your schedule. So since we met the last time, which was uh, right after kind of the first of the year, uh, the legislature had just started its work and we all had our fingers crossed then that they would complete their work in a timely fashion. But as we all know, they are now in their second special session. Uh, there does not seem to be a whole lot of movement forward on budget and school funding and all of those questions that they're dealing with. Um, but you all have jobs to do for your district. So I kind of want to toss it out and say, where are we? What have you folks been talking about? Um, you've got any highlights you can share with us as to where we are? And I, I just want to open that up to whoever kind of wants to start with that. I can jump in. Um, during this time of the year, we're really planning for next year. And it is difficult when you don't know what your funding is going to be to be able to move forward with recommendations that you've heard from teachers and administrators and patrons for expanding services. And uh, so a lot of our budget process so far going into next year has been maintaining current programs and um, realigning our staffing to match our enrollment and things that we know. Um, but the longer that we have to put off being able to implement new programs and add staffing to meet current needs, the more difficult it's going to be for us um, in August and September to really have those programs ready to go for the school year. So we're very concerned about um, not knowing what our budget is. That makes sense. I, I would just add, I, I think uh, Deb stated it very uh, clearly, uh, we have a public process with our budget adoption as well and uh, we take pride in taking our ideas out to the community, uh, sharing them, trying to gather feedback and I think uh, this will uh, certainly have an effect on the public sharing of our budgets as well with our communities and gathering community input. We still have a regular budget process that we have to go through, but it will be accelerated. And uh, we haven't really moved much beyond uh, the notion of what kind of enhancements would we like to make to our school system. We, I, I think all of us as uh, school superintendents and as school districts look at ways every year to improve the kinds of services that we're uh, going to be offering to our, our students in the next year. And at uh, this point, we, we, we have a, an imagined list of where we can go, but we don't know if we can do those. And we'd like to move on staffing, we'd like to move on facilities, we'd like to move in multiple ways, and we really can't move. And I think that's the challenge for us. It's concerning because um, uh, a lot of the talk gets pointed at a McCleary fix, which really targets 2018 and 19. Um, but we don't know what we're doing in 17, 18 from a financial standpoint yet. So um, one of the realities that we're, uh, I'm concerned about is that if the McCleary fix forces us back to the bargaining table with contracts that we've already negotiated and without the ability to plan, I think we're all planners and we want to look forward and move forward, is that if we are forced to delay that planning and go back to the bargaining table um, to renegotiate salaries with teachers and and administrators and um, classified employees. That's that's another delay in getting to what we th we think is the right thing for students. And um, so yeah, it's a little bit stressful right now. Not have, not only knowing about next year, but then the years after that. And I would just add that um, our work with our local legislators um, tells us that there's really two broad areas of dispute among legislators right now. Uh, one is how do you fund uh, the additional investment in public education that the McCleary case requires? They do agree that additional funding is necessary, but there's broad disagreement as we understand it still uh, about how to fund that. 
Uh, and then the second major challenge they face is educator compensation. And so Brian mentioned it, a collective bargaining right now is how we largely go about determining uh, how much teachers, other employees get paid. In that collective bargaining process, a fundamental piece of the McCleary case was an over-reliance on local levies. And so a growing chunk of a teacher's salary, for example, has been coming from local levies while the state share of what a teacher costs has been declining over the years. That was a fundamental premise of the case. And so if you're going to reduce levies, uh, there needs to be a corresponding investment in educator salaries um, to compensate for that. When you have such disparity between districts that does exist today in what a teacher makes with the state and local portion combined, that's a major challenge. And so one of the issues they're facing is how do you uh, find some equity there? How do you account for regional differences in what it costs to buy a home or live in a certain place compared to another? And our understanding is they have not resolved those big issues yet, and that's why I think we're into a second special session. Well, and then there are also um, additional factors, I would think, like requirements on classroom size, so you have to have a certain number of heartbeats available to you know, cover the number of students. We know our community is growing, so you know that your school population is growing, so it's, uh, yeah, I, <laughs> I shake my head. <laughs> I think we all do. Um, so has this put you in any, any kind of a scenario where um, you've had, I know a couple of years ago we had this discussion, which is why I bring it up, um, where you've had to issue reduction in force notices. I know that those have to go out at a certain time in order for them to be, is that anything that's? We haven't. I don't think any of the No, I don't have. think we We've maintained our um, staffing levels based on current class size requirements. I think you bring up a good point though, if the state chooses to fund a smaller class size, that takes a lot of planning on right. our part, right. which we'd love to be able to do that to lower, continue to mm -hmm. lower class size. It typically requires more classrooms, mm -hmm. more teachers, and more space. And so more instructional materials to be divided up differently. And so being able to respond to whatever the de final decision is requires some time and planning. Mm -hmm. And I think we've made the assumption, uh, faulty or, or well planned, is that uh, given the McCleary case and given the dialogue that uh, we're, we're hoping that we'll, we won't receive fewer resources. And so we, we want to keep our staff whole. We, uh, we don't want to issue reduction in force and drive our teachers out of our community somewhere else because there's a very real teacher shortage. And so we're trying to uh, maintain our staff and we're making the assumption that the financial resources that are going to come our way via the state are going to improve. It's, but how they will be shifted and what uh, attachments will be made to those dollars is, is really what keeps me nervous. Mm -hmm. We've made very conservative um, projections towards next year and hired to those conservative projections. And concern, because we don't know what 17 and 18 is going to look like yet, is we might be in a position where we have to hire more teachers in late August or September or even after that. And that's very difficult and very hard on kids. Um, so again, it. It causes us to be conservative when we know um, the push from our communities is that more services can be provided and we want to provide those. Um, and that's a hard stalemate to be in. Mm -hmm. okay. I would just say teachers in classrooms serving our kids, that's, that remains our top priority. And so if we're holding on any other expenditures, mm -hmm. um, we certainly are not holding on that one because we know that's our top priority for this coming fall. And like Dick said, we're operating with an assumption that at least the same level of funding would come. We hope we're not wrong about that, we hope we're not wrong. <laughs> uh, but that's the way we're proceeding now. Okay. So is there anything that you have as a group, um, a, a specific message, any interactions that you've had specifically with legislators? I know you mentioned talking with the 22nd district legislators, but school districts in general, how are, how, are you, how are you getting that message to our legislators? And are they listening? That's the question, I guess. Well, I would say in our region, um, we've done a lot in that regard. 
um, to reach out, not only in the 22nd District, but an example is uh, Senator John Braun from Lewis County, who is one of the lead negotiators uh, for this session and part of the Senate majority. Mm -hmm. uh, he's actually reached out to superintendents and other groups and has done some town hall type things, asking us, well, what do you think about these different policies? And we welcome those opportunities, and I know all four of us have taken advantage of those invitations. In addition, we all report to uh, school directors who are elected officials for our school districts, and so um, the WASDA Association that is their professional association recently hosted in our region a legislative forum where we had three legislators, including Senator Braun, there to field questions okay. that superintendents and board members generated ahead of time. So those are some examples of things we are doing to engage and give our feedback and we hope they listen. Mm -hmm. Good. We have, um, there are a couple of um, key talking points that we have collectively agreed to, to address um, as we do have some concerns about uh, some of the differences in the proposals that are being considered at this time. And so I, I think we've done a good job of sharing what those concerns are so that we can explain how, it's in, how it would <coughs> impact school districts in a negative way. Mm -hmm. I know when we were together the last time, we knew that there was a proposal from the Senate, a proposal from the House, and a proposal from the governor's office. Have those, are there, are there still three proposals on the table at this point? I, I think you're primarily seeing a House and a Senate. Uh, that's where the, the discussion is taking place right now, and, and people are still in committee trying to sort through that, and um, that's what we're waiting on. Right. See what happens. Well, the session needs to end um, uh, successfully, we hope, by June 30th because that's when the budget expires and, you know, that's not too far from now. Right. <laughs> and sooner would be better. So, sooner yeah. would be better. So, well, let's move on a little bit beyond uh, this discussion and talk about beyond funding. There are lots of other things that schools need. So what are some of the things that you have need for in your districts beyond sufficient funding that our community can help with. Dick, I'll start with you. Well, I, I, I think the opportunity for uh, expanded school year, if you will, uh, we talk a little bit about summer programs and the kinds of things that we want to do with students who really have needs in terms of uh, academic needs, they might have food needs, um, and so We've worked hard to partner uh, with groups in the summertime. Uh, we'll have a, a special program called Power Scholars on the west side of Olympia uh, that's really about academic interventions, but it also provides opportunities uh, such as going to the, the Children's Museum and going mm -hmm. swimming on Fridays. And these are full day programs. And the partnerships with uh, Boys and Girls Clubs, with YMCA, uh, and the city, those types of uh, partnerships are really important for all of our students, but our, I think our most needy students really benefit from the opportunity in multiple ways. And uh, I'm appreciative of the partnerships that we have out there and that we'll be able to offer this summer. Mm -hmm. When you talk about summer, because the doors aren't locked in the summer, there's a lot that goes on. What's going on in Yelm this summer? Uh, we've got two really exciting programs. We have a large um, literacy program for our third grade students who um, uh, are having some struggles. And uh, we have a great partnership with Thurston County Food Bank to provide breakfast and lunch for those students. Um, it's a very, um, it, it's an exciting curriculum time, very similar to what you're talking about. It's, it's not just come back to class. It's have other experiences that, um, you know, get students comfortable with school and also work on their literacy skills at the same time. And also, we're, we're in the process of moving our ninth grade up to the high school again. Um, and uh, we have a program called uh, Tornado Academy. And that's some students who uh, we're bringing in um, six weeks early and um, getting them ready for high school. Again, a partnership trying to provide food and activities, um, call them field trips. But it's really about getting comfortable with school and um, starting off with a, a really good skill set. And there, there's a credit retrieval component to it as well. We're really looking forward to it. Good. And how about Tom Water? 
Similarly, uh, for the first time this summer, uh, we're going to start a Power Scholars program, much like Olympia has had, uh, two classrooms um, in addition to our elementary program that has focused on uh, helping kids in reading and math. We're finding that a growing number of kindergarten students are coming into our doors in full day kindergarten, uh, not having had much of any experience in any sort of organized setting, whether it be a daycare or a preschool. So this summer we're adding kind of a ramp up to kindergarten. We're trying not to call it a boot camp, uh, but the idea <laughs> is uh, get them ready, much like right. the ninth grade model. Right. Uh, and then uh, for years we've offered a high school credit retrieval summer opportunity so students can stay on track to graduate and we have had very good enrollment that way. And then all four districts are involved uh, in a skills center consortium, New Market Skills Center, and we have a robust uh, summer opportunity mm -hmm. there for kids. And we already are seeing um, healthy registration for those two sessions. Okay. So those are some examples. What's happening out in your schools? Um, similar, Power Scholars in its second year, this year it'll be at Lacey Elementary School, and that program is actually run by the Y. And um, we have the credit recovery program at South Sound High School. For our high school students. Okay. You've, two of you have mentioned credit recovery program and a lot of viewers may not know what that means. Oh sure. So uh, the, the program that we offer is online and students come to South Sound High School and work at their own pace and take a course that they may have already taken in high school but they didn't pass they that successful course. In. And yeah. so they get uh, individual attention to complete that course and they're doing it outside of the regular school year so that they can get back on track for their graduation. That's great. Okay. So um, let's talk a little bit about highlights from the year. Um, you know, I, I, there's always so many things to think about. Um, we're headed into the graduation season. That's always exciting. But there have been some good highlights, I think, at all of your districts, and I'm not sure where I left off. Brian or John? I think one of, one of our highlights this year um, has, has been planning for our reconfiguration uh, change. Mm -hmm. So next, next fall we'll open a kindergarten through <laughs> fifth grade elementary, six, eight middle schools, and nine, 12 at the high school, and um, did a very healthy um, staff shift, um, getting ready to open those buildings with that configuration and did so at the same time we're implementing new um, literacy curriculum and a new secondary math curriculum and um, neither one of those uh, planning efforts derailed the other. It was um, really proud of our teachers and how they have worked together um, to, to stay focused even through a lot of, of change and we're seeing some benefits of um, implementing those two very, very strong curriculums. Okay, I'm gonna go that way and come okay. pick up with you at the end. Well, I, I absolutely love the highlight section, so thank you for asking <laughs> well, every time. Fill it uh, in. And for our viewers, uh, aside from our work of leading school districts, I, I don't like to use the word cheerleader, but it's, it's, it's a it's big part of what we do. And uh, we have so much to be proud of, and it oftentimes doesn't get shared, so I'm grateful for the opportunity to do this. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to seize the bully pulpit and just run with it. Go so for thank it. you. Uh, Seven of our schools receive Washington Achievement Awards, and I'm, I'm very, very proud of that uh, because it, it signifies improvement, moving students from one point to the, to the next. And uh, I'm proud of those seven schools, and we have high expectations for all of our students and all of our schools, but that designation is something that I'm particularly proud of, and, and it reflects so well on our students and our <laughs> staff in the classroom that I'm very, very proud of that. Uh, we're breaking ground. Uh, well, actually, we're doing more than breaking ground. Walls are going up at, at our additions at uh, Pioneer Elementary and Hanson Elementary. And uh, beginning next year, we'll start the remodels of mm -hmm. uh, three other schools. Um, and there's something going on at Roosevelt, too. Something going on at Roosevelt. It. It's yeah, well, we're, yeah, we're there's staging. a lot going on <laughs> We're there, staging. So. Uh, our school <coughs> board this year was named a Board of Distinction, and that's well-deserved. They're a terrific group of people who've served a good long time, and uh, I'm very appreciative of them. Uh, our uh, Teacher of the Year for the ESD 113 is Melissa Charette, who's a special need, fabulous special needs teacher at Washington Middle School. We're very proud of her. Uh, 
Um, two more, I promise I'll be it. done. I can go, is, I can take the is, whole rest of the segment. This is the time. If you like. Uh, let me just mention t uh, uh, two other things. Uh, we've been working hard uh, and looking at how does our uh, school district serve people with uh, language difficulties, and we've started a, a Latino hotline uh, that's uh, staffed so we can answer really our, our biggest uh, growing population of non-English uh, speakers. We held a, a, a Latino night to kind of make sure that people knew who they could go to to talk about issues. And I think you'll only see more of that from our school district. We, we really recognize that we can improve in that area. And uh, finally, our school district hired a new superintendent, uh, uh, Dr. Patrick Murphy. And, and I think that's a <coughs> significant accomplishment and a good thing. And I think he will be a great leader for our school district. And he will be starting when? He will be starting July 1. There we go. Okay. And we good. actually spent the morning with him. We did. Oh, we did. He's down here transitioning already, good. which is really good. nice to see. Good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Deborah. So uh, a couple of things, um, just to kind of uh, piggyback on what Brian was saying about transition, North Thurston implemented a boundary change going into the school mm -hmm. year. And really, um, staff came together and helped families navigate that transition. And it's been a very smooth transition. People, everyone from our transportation department communicating with parents about bus routes and that transition early in the school year. And now it, it seems like um, it's always been the way that it is. Uh, so really thankful to everyone for making that smooth for all the families. The other work that we've been involved in all year has really been improving opportunities to hear directly from our students about their experience in our schools. So we piloted a student survey in 13 of our schools to hear directly from our students. And we also added student advisors to our school board. And for me as a new superintendent this year, uh, started a superintendent student advisory council. And so our students um, shared with us, so we had fifth graders, eighth graders, and seniors on the council. And um, one representative from each school and students shared with us their perspective on technology, on our compassionate community um, efforts within our schools, on bullying prevention, on our nutrition services program. They taste tested items and gave <laughs> us feedback and um, I truly enjoyed it because as a superintendent, we go in classrooms a lot, but we try not to be disruptive and we don't often get to connect individually with students the way that we did when we were teachers. And I've enjoyed getting to know a few mm -hmm. students better mm -hmm. through that process. Was there, any, was there anything particularly surprising that came up from the input from the students that you went, huh? Um, some simple things um, came up that were, to me, impactful. Um, one as an example, when we were talking about how to help kids feel safe at school, mm -hmm. overwhelmingly our students shared with us just having teachers visible, whether it's in hallways or out on the playground, having an adult visible that they can go to. Um, so things that reaffirmed uh, good practices that we know are, are, are good practices were um, shared by our, directly by our students. Great, okay. John. I'm gonna go with a community theme because uh, that's been a priority for us as part of our strategic plan mm -hmm. to engage with the community uh, in two ways. One, to address barriers kids and families face to fully benefiting from school. Uh, and the other was to create new learning experiences for students and so I know later in the program there will be a feature mm -hmm. because one of our most recent partnerships was with Thurston Community mm -hmm. Media and with our video production students at uh, Black, Black Hills, Hills High School. Mm -hmm. They helped Tumwater Middle School students uh, produce a video on the day in the life of a middle school student because one of the highlights this year is two major projects at both our middle schools, new wings so that we can bring sixth grade <coughs> into the middle school and like our neighbors then serve sixth through eighth grade at the middle school level. Likewise, um, we have expanded our partnerships with the community. A uh, couple of examples there uh, with the city of Tumwater 
and a garden raised urban bounty. We're graduating our first cohort of 24 students in our uh, community garden program. Nice. And um, I went and you know, spoke at a celebration there recently and I had several of the students come up and say, can you create another one? Because I don't want this to end. And <laughs> they're very excited about what they've learned and now many of them have a passion for pursuing that as they move forward. Um, we've established community family resource centers in our schools now with our community schools model focused on bringing services that aren't educational services but services that address those basic needs to the schoolhouse where our kids are already there. An example this year was Seamar uh, Health Services mm -hmm. coming in. We provide space and they provide mental health services to qualifying students who need that help um, and their families. Um, beyond the community uh, engagement work, um, our community, like these others, has supported uh, bond issues that help us uh, create the new space that we need for a growing district and for quality learning spaces. So we opened the new Peter G, as I've mentioned in an earlier program, right. and that has been a wonderful uh, experience this year in their first full year. And we found that we've hosted lots of groups now that want to come look at Peter G because they're planning and designing their project. Little Rock Elementary will open its brand new doors uh, this fall, along with the two middle schools. And then we're just in design phase for an upgrade to East Olympia Elementary School. So those are a few highlights of things that have been accomplished this year, but this is probably the most exciting time of year for me as a superintendent because I'm attending honors and award ceremonies, mm -hmm. graduations, and this sort of culminating exit that's a little bittersweet because, you know, we develop wonderful relationships with our kids, but I'm so impressed with what they've accomplished and where they're going into the millions of dollars of scholarship money our kids have earned. Um, and some impressive futures that they've already planned for themselves. So a wonderful time of year that way. It is. And congratulations to all of you for successful school years. Um, as John mentioned, um, Thurston Community Media staff person Robert Cam mentored a group of Black Hills High School students as they created a video to help the transition from elementary school to middle school for students in the Tumwater District. So we want to share that video with you now, and then we'll come back to wrap up the show. Whoa, 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 it's not like that at all. Middle school isn't as scary as you think it is. In the morning, I usually hang out with friends in the commons and that's not the only thing you can do. If you need help with your classes, you can go over to your teachers, you can ask them for help. If you didn't eat breakfast at home, you can go to the cafeteria, eat there. And if you want, you can go outside, you can go to the library, read a book or two, or check out some books. And When the bell rings, we usually go to our first period to start the day, and the middle school schedules are different from elementary school schedules because we have six periods in the day, and we also have a study hall time called ops. If you get lost here at TMS, you should probably find an adult. Uh, they will be willing to help you to get wherever you need to go at any time. Uh, the types of classes you can take in middle school are choir, band, orchestra, yearbook, leadership, gym, and there's art too. And my favorite one would have to be Honors English. Um, the middle school classes are a bit harder than the elementary school classes, but they're not so hard that you can't do it. Everybody can. Um, and the elementary schools are, have been trying really hard to get you prepared and I think they're doing a good job. Hi, I'm Mr. Belmer and I'm moving up to Tumwater Middle School next year to teach sixth grade language arts. And so I want to give you some encouragement that it's going to be a little bit scary but I think we, together we can do well. TMS offers a variety of athletics and activities from co-ed cross country, football and soccer to girls basketball, boys basketball, wrestling, volleyball and co-ed track. 
My favorite sport is basketball and I love playing it to get to know new people and learn from them, learn from my coaches and just hang out with my friends. TMS is a very special school. We have some of the sharpest staff that I've ever seen or even heard of. All of the teachers here really care about every single student that walks in um, and they want to show you that they want to know your story and they want to help you be successful. I think that TMS is a special place because of the sense of community that we have here. Uh, every one of our staff members is willing to go the extra mile to help kids, to stay late uh, and make this a positive place. And as a staff member, I also feel that sense of community. So uh, it's a very caring environment. And uh, we, I think we really meet the needs of the students. A Firewolf is a sixth, seventh, or eighth grader at Tillmarter Middle School. It's an awesome tradition. Uh, we do have a, a thing called power here that we focus on. I don't know if you can see behind me, but it stands for pride, ownership, warmth, encouragement, and respect. I think it's really important to have pride for your school because it shows how much you care and it really helps you get through middle school. And to me, it means that you take responsibility for the things you do, even if it has bad consequences or you'll get in trouble. It means um, you're very open, accepting, and very loving. That means to help everyone be positive, not negative. What it means to me is respect your teachers and students and the property. I think the biggest advice I can give to an incoming sixth grader is to just breathe. It's gonna get stressful and you're gonna panic a little bit and the hallways are gonna seem endless. Um, so just breathe, take a big deep breath and calm down. For sixth graders to get involved in school, to do things like join sports, join clubs, really take control of their learning, pay attention in class, expect to have fun and they will have a good time. Welcome. 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 Welcome to Tumwater Middle School. I'm John Wilcox, principal. Can't wait to see you in September. So, great work by the students at Black Hills and at Tumwater Middle School. And thanks to Robert Cam on the Thurston Community Media staff for helping with that project uh, with support from the city of Tumwater. So, you know, I remember that transition from elementary school to middle school, and it was a little daunting. And I think this was a wonderful way to welcome new students to, to middle school. So we're going to kind of coming up to the end of the program now. And this one's a little bit bittersweet because, as we've mentioned earlier, there's going to be a new superintendent from uh, a Lilympia School District uh, here at the table in the fall. Um, but we want to give you an opportunity, Dick, to, you know, share with the community um, what you would like to share and say your goodbyes um, to the community and, and to the roundtable. <laughs> oh, to, to, well, to my roundtable colleagues, thank you very much for being such great colleagues. And Deb, thank you for hosting us and giving this forum so we can share aspects of what's happening in public education. Um, I would say uh, a few things. Uh, one, uh, I, I've always taken the job and the role seriously, but I've tried to take myself not so seriously. Uh, and I, I think there's a, a message there. The real work goes on in the classrooms, which we just saw in the video. And superintendents have a role to play, and uh, we try to do that the best that we can. Uh, in Olympia, I've had the benefit of uh, serving with great teachers, great paras, terrific board uh, these last five years, and just a really tremendous uh, community that supports. We had close to 50,000 volunteer hours in our schools this year. And I don't think I could have asked for anything more. So after 42 years, I feel like I can, uh, well, as the video suggested, I can take a deep breath. I can <laughs> breathe, I can breathe and honestly say that uh, truly, every day has been a, a new adventure and a day that I've enjoyed. And uh, I hope that I've left something uh, behind that truly benefits the students of our community. So thank you for the opportunity. You're more than welcome. I know that many of your colleagues have, um, they've, you've been recognized in a lot of different ways. I did want to point out when I was just kind of looking through that the Washington Schools Public Relations Society um, recognized you with their Crystal Apple Award in, for this year for your 42 years of service to public education. Um, so I know that um, as a resident of the city of Olympia, I thank you for your work. Um, I have young family members in the Olympia School District and they are, they're being well, education, well educated and I greatly appreciate that. So I was wondering if anyone else had anything they wanted to share. I just want to thank Dick for uh, his service to our community and for 
the collaboration, one thing that I think makes Thurston County unique in the ed in public education is the teamwork that happens, not mm -hmm. just among these four districts, but this morning we came from a meeting with Thurston County superintendents, and there's a strong commitment uh, to collaboration, teamwork, sharing good ideas, uh, and that's why you hear a lot of similar answers to some of your questions in this program, because if it works well in Olympia, uh, why not try it out if we can make it work and it meets a need in our school district. So thank you, Dick, and congratulations on your retirement. As a first-year superintendent, it's been so great to be able to call Dick at any time or walk out to the parking lot after a meeting and, and just pick his brain. And that's part of the collaboration that we have that John spoke about. But um, I, it, it really um, helped me set a tone that part of our role in, the, in this job is to, is to continue to help the next group that comes along. So thank you for, for that level of, of collaboration and mentorship. As a new superintendent as well, um, Dick was officially my mentor this year, and just as new teachers have a, a mentor, um, Dick was my mentor, and he was always very um, helpful to me, uh, welcomed me into the area. It's a brand new area for me. I didn't know any of the other school districts, and so I really appreciate your support. I learned more from her. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we will miss you at the round table, but I know that you are on to retirement. So any plans after your last day? I mean, what's, what's the plan for your future? Um, I, th I think the plan for the future is to be a better uh, husband, father, <laughs> and grandparent and uh, be able to spend that time uh, together. I really look forward to that. Uh, my colleagues would tell you, and I, I don't want to be self-serving, this is a very demanding job. Uh, you spend a lot of nights away from home, and uh, I look forward to spending that time at home. Well, congratulations, and again, thank you for your 42 years of service to our children and to public education, and we wish you all the best thank as you. you move into a new adventure in your life. And Dick isn't the only person moving on to new adventures. It's graduation season, so for all of you parents of graduates out there, congratulations, job well done. And to our graduating seniors, congratulations. May your life journey be filled with joy and success. If you're interested in participating in your child's education, please talk to your child's teacher or to the principal at your child's school. There are many ways that you can get involved. Remember, if you're the parent of a preschool child, please read to your child 20 minutes a day. It's one of the best things you can do to prepare them for education and throw in some number games to get them interested in math. We'll be back in the fall with another edition of the Superintendent's Roundtable with a new face at the table. We hope you'll join us then. Thanks for watching.